Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Hein, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flutt. How are you, buddy? Hello, Benny. I'm great because I have podcast news for you. And oh, actually, wow. not even podcast news. I have Pro Tools news for you. That's what okay. I actually meant to say, if I'm honest. That was just a, a brain fart. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. What's going uh, on? Both P words that got me. But Pro Tools has announced, and you're just going to make fun of me, but I'm honestly excited. But everybody else is going to be like, oh, geez. Uh, they've announced support for ARA. <laughs> I can see you just like, oh yeah. man, really? Uh, <laughs> so it, it's going to be like. You can finally like, use Melodyne properly. Well, I mean, you can use Melodyne already uh, and it works really well, but now yeah. it's going to be like fully integrated yeah. um, to a, a very cool degree, which Got is it. fantastic because that is uh, an amazing tool. <laughs> this is like something that the rest of the audio world has had for eons, and us Pro Tools users are just getting it and we're so thrilled. Mm. But, yeah. but anything that makes us happy <laughs> makes other people make fun of us. <laughs> yeah, how exactly. that works. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and you you still get other things going for you with not not too many anymore these days. But like, <laughs> we pay tools, more. Like, we pay more. Is that yeah? Help? <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's one. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure one. Yeah, but but great. Like, uh, yeah, I'm honestly just happy for you that you can finally do that. Yeah, honestly, I don't even think it's here yet. Like, I I haven't downloaded oh, okay. any new update, but I think it was just an email saying it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's something to look to look forward to, right? So yeah. you know, I don't even need ARA because like Cubase has it built into the software that I can just use the, the tuning thing that it has, and it works great. So I don't need Melodyne. Um, right. Well, Pro Tools comes with Melodyne. Oh. I, I don't know if you knew that, but so it's, no. it's ARA oh, wow. support, but they give you Melodyne. It's like essentials, like the you know oh, the monophonic kind of base level. Um, I didn't even know that. Is, is was it always the case? No, no, that no. was uh, a year or two ago, I think. Ah. Um, so they didn't yeah. build their own version of like very audio. No, or something. they just they decided just to kind of Melodyne. partner with them and do it that way. Which is kind of smart yeah. because Melodyne is pretty much as good as it gets when it comes to yeah. that stuff. So T totally, yeah. So th that's that's pretty great. Um, ah, cool. Yeah, looking forward to getting to speed up that workflow for sure. <laughs> awesome. So the, the one question about there before we get into the episode. Because I know a couple of Pro Tools users that I was talking to, also people that I coach, that who are who were asking me about whether it's worth like buying the Melodyne and if it already comes with Melodyne, it's just the essential, right? But is it worth then upgrading to some? Like, is there anything you can't do with that? Because I I know a couple of Pro Tools users who ask about whether or not they should buy something else. But when it already comes with that, I wonder why they're not getting the results they want with the essentials. Yeah, I really like the upgraded version, but I did get by just fine with the essentials. Um, it's just faster, uh, and mm -hmm. I can pull off a little more heavy-handed stuff mm -hmm. with the the upgraded version as well. Um, I actually have used the polyphonic stuff as well, but like that's that's yeah, kind of too. above and beyond what the average person would need. I do a lot of bass tuning, and I find that those second tier and up kind of abilities are are useful for that as well. Getting that done well. So not essential to upgrade, but you can. But it's nice because you got the first essentials for free and they always come out with these deals for upgrading um, that make it super affordable to, to upgrade as well. So I would just make do with essentials and then if a, an upgrade comes along and you're using it all the time, then yeah, go for it. It's going to save you time. But you definitely don't need to go for it unless there's a, a special available. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Thank you for that. I didn't see, I didn't even know that one. Um it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to see how it integrates. It looks like they're they're doing it pretty well from what I've seen, but haven't looked too far into it as of yet. Great. Yeah. Well, so that's my uh, news in audio. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exciting. I mean, that's that's cool. Yeah. So any other? I mean, I don't know. I always ask about other stuff, but maybe we maybe we shouldn't even talk about so much other stuff before we dive into the yeah. episode. I'm just like always curious. People, you know, yeah. like usually Malcolm and I have a little time to to talk about other things too, but we haven't seen each other a lot during the last couple of months because you were away with like your TV stuff and that. So yeah. those podcast ep recording dates are basically also our catch up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thing. We're, we're um, so out. that's that's why I always want to know everything, which is totally not relevant to you guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, yeah. We, we can jump into it because I know we're gonna get a we're gonna get a hangout call in soon. So <laughs> we'll yeah, let the exactly. listener learn. Exactly. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Um. I have one thing to say. Um. Before we get into this, that is that is um, audio related or like recording related. I had a call earlier this today, actually this morning, 
with Collider State. They are a great band from um, Australia that I w- I'm currently working with in the coaching. I also mixed uh, their EP, and I'm using one of their songs on the next Mixes Unpacked, which is going to be out very soon, I promise. <laughs> awesome. But like, um, maybe even by the time this episode airs, I don't know, but it's like very close. And I used one of their songs. I'm going to have them on the podcast too. I don't think they know this already, but they will be on the podcast. <laughs> uh, no, and, it's not up to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, by the time you hear this episode, they they will know and, and we've probably already recorded it. So they're definitely down. Now, what why I'm uh, telling you this is that I had a call with them earlier today, a coaching call, and we were talking about the progress they were making on their next EP. And what, so, what was so cool about this was that they, for the first time, followed like a quote unquote proper process. They went through writing, produ- like writing the songs, arranging the songs, recording demos, documenting all of that without f- focusing on any of the technical stuff. They did that first and they got a pretty rough version of the songs and the arrangements done and sent that over and we discussed that. And then they made a list of things to to buy or to adjust and set up and like get ready for the recording which is a separate step, basically. They worry about the tech later. At first, it was all about the songs. Now they're worrying about their equipment. Now they also planned in time to properly practice those songs. Like they, Now they are in the phase where they prepare for the actual recording session. And then when it comes time to actually record the songs, they only have to focus on the performance because the songs are done, the arrangements are done. They got feedback on that. They did that with full focus without focusing on any of the tech stuff, without worrying about any of those things. Then they had time to properly practice. They had time to try out their gear and set everything up. So when it comes time to record, they will be able to fully focus on that and deliver the best possible takes. And we were talking about this today, and they told me that they were so uh, happy about that that it actually made the whole process more fun also because it was all about the music. They had a blast jamming and just capturing those demos. And now they look forward to implementing all the notes that they took and buying the gear and all of that. And... That was so cool to hear for me because I know that a lot of people are having a hard time separating those things. A lot of people get so hung up in all the, the technical stuff and they go down these rabbit holes when they when, when actually the songs are not even done. And then when they track, they still have to change some parts or they don't know how a certain piece of gear works. So they do all these things at once and never really focus on one thing entirely. And in this case, they followed this plan and, and it was not only good for the results, but they actually enjoyed the process more, which is super cool to hear because it's not, it didn't turn the whole thing into tedious work or a lot of planning, but it actually was more fun, more productive. And yeah, I'm telling you this because it made me happy to hear that. And if you want a plan like that for yourself, then you can go to the self recording band.com slash call and talk to me about this because that's exactly what I do here. I come up with a roadmap for people and help them then implement this roadmap and give them feedback and all of that. That's what we do in the coaching. And it all starts with the first free call where I can sort of come up with a plan for you that you can then take and run and implement yourself or get my help doing so. And uh, yeah, this is just something I wanted to share because, yeah, again, it was so cool to hear that. And you're going to hear that song soon if you get our Mixes Unpacked Volume 2 course. You hear one of the songs from their first EP. And then uh, it's going to be interesting to hear the difference to that second EP that they're working on right now. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. That's awesome. And yeah, it is really cool to hear that not only was it a better product and end result, yeah. it was actually more enjoyable for them too. That's great. And I bet they just learned so much along the way um, as well. It's just like, it's just going to make the next one even even more of an accomplishment. Very cool. Yeah, for sure. So that was that was my story that really made my day today. And I thought it was much worth mentioning on the on the episode. So yeah, About today's episode, (laughs) this is another topic that I talk a a, a lot about um, on my coaching calls with people. And it's also something that some people refuse to believe for a while until they do, and then it it all makes sense. So it's also one of those topics that, I don't know for, for, and I I think I was the same basically um, a couple of years back. It's one of those things that we tend to not really think about or to think that it's not really important and it doesn't matter. And the topic is, the question of who's your audience? Like, who Mm -hmm. are the songs for that you're creating? This, I think, a lot of people don't have a great answer to that, and I think, or think it doesn't matter, because they think they should just make the music that they personally want to make and not think about anybody else. And I want to discuss this because having an audience in mind and creating music that you personally love are not mutually exclusive. I think you can do both. Yes. And I th- I'm definitely sure that your songs and therefore ultimately your band or your music project, if you're a solo artist, 
will absolutely benefit from that, from writing and producing for an audience. And I want to talk about how to actually do that, who that audience could be, and why this is actually beneficial for your music, to your music. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I obviously love this topic. Um, if you're a longtime listener of this podcast, you probably know that I had slash have a podcast called Your Band Sucks at Business, which we talk about this kind of stuff quite a bit at length. We're, we're not making any new episodes on that right now, but there's a whole back catalog of, of good stuff there that you should check out if you're interested in this kind of stuff. But this is like the perfect conversation for this podcast because there's this this middle ground where, yeah, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, like you said. It, it can be even more rewarding if you get this right, I think, to, to create art that you love, but is also connecting with people. It's just all about figuring out who those people are and then realizing hey, these people are... Like they're like me and they're also enabling me to create more art because they like what I'm doing. It, it's it's in your best interest to figure this out 100%. Yes, for sure. And just so you know, I want to start this with a quote because a lot of people think, as I said, that like thinking about an audience or writing music, quote unquote, for other people means that you're selling out or you're selling your soul basically you're writing something that you don't really care about just because you could sell more copies or whatever this is not what i'm talking about and or what we're talking about and i interviewed jay moss on the podcast on my other podcast once if you don't know jay jay is a, a producer and mixer mainly in the hardcore punk rock world and he's like he's totally a, a punk actually he really does whatever <laughs> he wants and he doesn't care about any rules he does he does whatever think he thinks is cool or the artist he's working with think is, is cool. And uh, when I was interviewing him and talking about this thing, even, even Jay Maz said that, and I quote him here, if you're thinking about you when you're making a record, it probably has much less of a chance of being successful than if you're thinking about who it's for. So and so even even bands like the bands like uh, the ones that Jay works with, and even he, he is of that opinion that um, yeah, it matters who your songs are for. Every every single punk band that I've ever met, even if they say like we don't care about selling records, we don't like it's all commercial bullshit, whatever. I used to be the same, but even those bands want somebody to listen to their music. Like they yeah. they and like everybody wants that. Like nobody just records music so that that they can listen to it themselves. Like that's almost nobody. So even those people want to reach a certain group of people with their music. And even if you don't think about an audience, you automatically attract one just by yeah. who you are and what you do. So why not do that intentionally? This is why I wanted to talk about all this. Absolutely, yeah. It, it It's fascinating because we do want people to come to our shows. We do want them to scream along and rock out and stuff like that. So we need them to connect to our music. And if our music doesn't resonate with them, doesn't connect with them, it's not for them, that's not going to happen, obviously. So it's this catch-22. Um and, you know, the opposite is true. If it's working for all of them, but you are not enjoying playing it, it's it, it, it actually, that's not even possible, I don't think. I don't think you can go and perform music that you don't like and convince people that you do like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> or at least that's hard. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, and so, so really, it's best if it's doing both things. Now, we are called the Self-Recording Band Podcast, obviously, but I want to draw attention to uh, one thing that you might not have considered if you've gone from ha having a producer to doing it yourself. Um, when you hire a producer, they are that person that's thinking about the audience generally. They're mm -hmm. thinking about themselves. And that, like, so if a band approaches me and when I was doing producing and, and hired me, it, I usually would have said yes because I dug the music and it connected with me. I'm, I'm the target audience, perhaps even, or at least I know who would be. And... I'm now making decisions based on what what I want to hear and and what what's like okay I can picture being in the crowd singing along to this chorus we got to say that phrase over and over again cuz that's the hook kind of thing stuff like that where if you don't have that you're just making it for yourself you might not see that um so it's extra important I think as a self recording band to consider what we're talking about today because it was maybe being taken care for you before this if you had a producer that wasn't in the band so it's it's like this is a step that happens uh, when you're hiring ex outside producers, but not necessarily when you're self-producing. And we we need that box to get checked still. Absolutely, that's a great great point. Part of why a lot of self-recording artists don't really do it is because 
a lot of people, I think, don't understand the the role of a producer correctly, which is a, a topic for an entirely different episode. But it's it's basically that it's like thinking about what, like how to make something that helps the the artist and or the label or both, in, ideally, achieve the goals that they have, and how to how to then bring in the best possible team for that, which tools to choose, all the, all that is what a producer does. So they definitely think about who it's for and what is required to in order to reach those those types of uh, people and if you're if you don't have that producer anymore and you're on your own you have to do that you have to be the engineer and the producer and the musician and all of that and these days also probably the label and everything else so yeah i mean and that's just just, just the reality and it's a good thing that's absolutely a good thing there's no gatekeepers anymore but it also means more responsibility more things to do on on your end and um you have to make sure that you make something that people actually want to listen to or the people you want to reach actually care about that's more uh, more important. So you don't want to necessarily create something that most people like, but you want to create something that the people you want to reach care about. And I, th- I think everybody wants that, to be yes, honest. Absolutely. So, okay. So I think it all comes down to a couple of questions that you can ask yourself. Um, it's mainly about, first of all, you have to define your goals. You have to know what you actually are trying to achieve. Uh, and I mean that as a musician, but also in your life in general, because some people don't have any career ambitions as musicians, but they want to, I don't know, they want, maybe it's called like validation or I don't know. It's like they want feedback from other people telling them that they like their music basically, or they want to have an impact on other people, or they want to write it for one particular person and they want that person to love the song. Or, you know, this can be very personal things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a career goal, but like something that makes you create this piece of music. So think about Mm. the goals first, I think. What are you trying to achieve? And an honest question to ask yourself along with that is is most of the time, who are you trying to impress with your music? Because, you know, we we obviously like it when other people like our stuff. So who who are you trying to reach and and who are you like who are you hoping who are you hoping to reach and what is the reaction that those people should have when they listen to your music? Like yes. what, what reaction are you hoping to get back from them, basically? Yeah, here's a quick exercise. Picture yourself in your favorite venue that you've ever been to. Um, not even played, been to and seen concert, and picture yourself on stage and looking out at the audience that's obviously sold out, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, what do those people look like? Like, who are they, right? You're going to learn, like, what age they are by visualizing that. You're going to, you know, know how they would have dressed, probably, how they're reacting to your music. Are they moshing? Are they jumping? Are they respectively seated at tables? fine dining at the same time and talking amongst themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That sounds like my nightmare, but that might be yeah. exactly what a jazz <laughs> musician wants. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so like, but by doing that, there's a demographic that, that exists and that is, that, that is your audience. And so we'll circle back to that, but let's keep going through your, your list here, Benny. Yeah, that's a great exercise. And it's important that you said picture yourself in a venue and like think of an ideal situation because that ideal situation might not be your current reality. Like the people mm-hmm. that are actually now at your shows might be different from the ones you see when you like visualize all of that. And the reason might be that you are that you want to attract certain people, but for whatever reason, other people show up to your shows. And in that case, you have to ask yourself, why is that? Like, are we yeah. attracting people? Are we attracting the wrong people just by how we do things, like yeah. how how we are, like who we are, how we dress, what the image is that we created for our band, what our music sounds like. Maybe you would actually want something different, but you haven't thought about it, so you're attracting the wrong people. Could could be the case. I mean, who knows? Absolutely. And also, like if you could show your music to like anybody you want, like who who would you show it to? Like if you could say, I want, if I could reach the you know the the boss of that label or the person making that playlist or you know some some influential p- person. If you could just walk into their office and like play your music for them, like who would that person be first of all? And then what would your music sound like in order for them to be impressed and 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 do something with that? Right. Then, you know, uh, you you probably if you have a goal like that, it definitely makes sense to think about about that. And then how do you want those people to react to your music? And what do you want those people do or feel after listening to your music? And this could be again influential people. This could be just one person that you wrote the song for. This could be your friends. This could be a certain demographic, um, but I guess there's something that you have in mind, some reaction that you would want to have. Um, yeah, I love, that's like another great exercise. Who would you show it to? And like for me growing up, I remember being like, if I could just like get backstage and get a CD to that that person, 
they'd check it out and they'd be like, you're coming on tour with us, you know? Like, yes. <laughs> probably not how that would go, by the way, even if they liked yeah. it. But yeah. uh, <laughs> knowing yeah. how the business works a little bit better now than I did, uh, it, it's, it, that's still like useful to think about because that person that I would want to show it to is obviously in the same kind of genre. They probably have a similar audience. So you can look at their audience now and be like, oh, these people like this type of show, you know, like, like Benny is framing all this rightfully so about music, like the music you're creating, but uh, you, all of these exercises and, and ideas can be transferred to uh, what your stage show looks like, um, how you're dressing, um, how you're interacting with the audience on and off stage. You know, are you like personable smiles all around? You're hanging out. Or are you too cool for school? Sunglasses on, you have a, security guards escorting you out of the venue you know like yeah. <laughs> that's a very different relationship with the audience but both have been made successful at different times right yes so so like yeah like comparing yourselves to somebody that has what you're looking for is actually a pretty good idea i think yeah for sure for sure and again this might like, this is one of those things again I, I completely agree but this is one of those things that again will sound to some people like bullshit that they don't want to care about like how I dress or how we act or how what we do on stage and stuff like that. But I think you can do that and still be you. You can still be authentic and and put but put thoughts some thought into that. Think about another person that comes to mind is is Greg Benick. I've mentioned him before on the show. Greg Benick is the singer of a very personally important to me like um, hardcore band uh, called Trial. They are not like by any means like um, commercially like successful or anything. They are like an underground hardcore band, but very important in the scene. And he's he's just a genius. He's doing a lot of nonprofit work. He's building houses in Haiti and feeding homeless people. And um, he he does like all these things. And he's also a keynote speaker for like big companies. He's a TEDx um, speaker, and oh, wow. he's um, he's doing consulting and um, what, what's it called rhetoric um, sort of coaching um, consulting for for other speakers as well. And like he's just a, a genius. And the, when he goes on stage to present something that's really important to him, like to get a message across, it could be a nonprofit thing, it could be a, a keynote thing, gig speaking about some important thing that he cares about. When he does that, he definitely thinks about who the audience is, mm-hmm. how he can best reach them, how he acts on stage, what he looks like, how he speaks, like all these things, because he knows that his message that's, that's important to him will come across better, will reach more people and have more impact. And He's not about selling out or any of that, but he wants his message to be heard. And uh, I talked to him about this a lot, and I talked to him about how he writes lyrics and all of that. And he always says he thinks about an audience because that's the best way to reach that audience, and that's ultimately what he wanted, what he wants to do with his message. And he was never about like being commercially successful, but he was all about getting his message message across and right. and communicating what's important to him. So even if you don't care about all of this it still matters if you want people to pay attention and really care about what you're putting out. And I think all of us want that, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, Yeah. Going back to what you just said of like, you know, I don't want to be just like everyone else. I don't want to just copy somebody. The, it's all kind of how you look at something. I think you could look at somebody that's doing what you want, especially in punk um, and be like, one person might look at that and be like, okay, well, I want to dress like them. I want to write my music like them. Or you could realize that they're successful because they're different than all these other bands, right? Like, and and the their uniqueness is the thing to copy. It's like, oh, we just need to be, we need to do the the opposite of the people we're playing with. And <laughs> this is a hilarious thing you'll notice now if that I mention it. If you go to some local shows and you're you're seeing, everybody's dressed the same. <laughs> I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Everybody's dressed the same. All of the local bands have these weird similarities and it's because that's what scenes do. Break that mold and now yeah. you're you're standing out, right? Like there's this self-analysis and like introverted thinking about your your band and image and brand can lead to be, being different, not necessarily being more like things. Um, so it, it's really up to you what you take from it. Absolutely, absolutely. You can you can absolutely be you and, and and think about how you can bring up more of that uniqueness. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you can. That's an exercise that I a question that I ask people a lot actually when I work with them also is, uh, and also the people that I mix for when we have the first call. I always ask, what is special about the way you create music, or about what what do you personally like when in, in other artists or in music that you listen to? What is it that you do as a band that you think is kind of yours and that mm-hmm. we can bring out more of? Because I want to find that thing and 
bring it out and, and put even more emphasis on that. And, uh, you know, obviously also with an audience in mind, but you can, you can make, you can do both. You can bring that out. You can create your own sort of style and vibe and everything. And you can simultaneously think about who it is for and who you want to attract and then get the two together because your audience might be people similar to you. Don't have to be, but they might. And then that's totally valid. So you don't have to write for a group of people that you don't know anything about. Obviously, you can write about people in your scene, people just like you. And believe it or not, a lot of people think that's what you do it, what you do nat um, naturally anyways, but that's not the case. A lot of people think they write for people just like them, but they actually end up attracting completely different people because they never really thought about what they actually like. And if that yeah. is really what they're doing in their music, they think they sound like all their favorite bands, but actually they're not. And, you know, stuff like that. So, Yeah, ex exactly. This isn't on our outline, but uh, another interesting thought that I like to bring up is who you're comparing yourself against, there's a story. Man, who said this? I wish I remembered who said this, but somebody, I feel like it was somebody I knew, <laughs> was uh, getting a ride home from a concert they had played and they were talking about how they thought they were better than the headliner that they played with or something like that. And then like, you know, why, like, why aren't they getting traction? And their dad was like, why are you comparing yourself to this other local band that's not successful either? Like compare yourself to ACDC or something, you know, like, or equivalent. Yeah. And it was like, oh, right. Like there's this whole other league that I'm like, I, I haven't even been looking at. And like, if I, you know, compare myself to them, obviously that's going to be a higher bar that I'm setting myself against. So, I don't know, that's kind of unrelated, but kind of related to yeah, this Yeah, I totally I get like. it, though. Yeah. That's a great way to think about it, though. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, so your audience, I think, can be, as we said, your audience can be different types of people. It can be people like you, but it can also be a completely different group. Like, mm -hmm. totally depends. I think asking yourself the questions that we just talked about will help you find and or refine your style. You might already have found your style and your sound, but it might also help you refine your style and sound, as well as overcome writer's block. This is something I wanted to talk about too, because if you don't know what to write about or you're kind of stuck and you don't know like what, yeah, if, if you have maybe a draft, but you can't really turn it into a real song or you don't even know where, where to start, thinking about the audience really helps sometimes because if you the, the, more, the more clearly you see your avatar sort of or your uh, target audience, the easier it will become to write something that they care about. Because if you have that person in front of you, think about you writing a song for one specific person that you know, like your best friend or your partner or whoever. You probably know at least a little bit about what that person generally likes or don't, doesn't like, what topics they're interested in, how they, like which, which artists they typically listen to, um, how they communicate, all those things. And this will probably help you make it easier to come up at least with a, a broad topic or something that those people care about and maybe even how to communicate that. So if you can define that audience for yourself, it might help you overcome writer's block because you at least know who you're talking to, which makes things yeah. easier than talking into a vacuum, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. And only if nothing on that list that we just talked about, like none of these questions, none of those things at all, like really matters to you. If none of that is important to you, if it's really just for yourself, only then I think you can stop thinking about an audience because then, I mean, yeah. you can record it and then just listen to it yourself. And that's that's fine if that's what you want to do. But I think most people make music so that it comes out uh, out of speakers somewhere and not yeah. your own speakers <laughs> exclusively. Yeah, most people want people to like it. They want people to come to their shows, right? So it's, exactly. it's worth considering. Yeah. Okay, so who could your audiences, audience be? Um, people yeah. just like you, we said that. Yeah, yeah. So this is like, what we're talking about is how to think about it and discover who those people would be like. It, this is like a little exercises for for um, figuring it out. So yeah, yeah, people that people just like you, you know. <laughs> um, and, and there's a huge advantage to this because it's not always people like you actually. You could be making music for people that aren't like you and that's mm -hmm. and that's totally cool still. But it's uh, I think it's easier if it is because a lot of your decisions are going to align. Like, you know, how you dress and stuff like that is probably already going to translate, uh, you know, in... In Canada, there's like the these like hipsters <laughs> that like you know their toques are always like just barely on their head. They're just like yeah. perched on top kind of thing and buttoned up just like as high as they can be, and uh, and just yeah. so against showing emotion <laughs> is how I think they are. But yeah. I'm sure they disagree and and yeah. hate me for saying all of this. But I am not one of them. You know, like if I end up in a room with one of them, like we, do, we can't even make eye contact. I'm like, we don't know how to, <laughs> we're not compatible people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they 
sure as heck don't like my music. So so that's really obvious. <laughs> not yeah. making music for them. Not going to try and, and and go after that. But uh, but yeah. So there's there's that. And there, there's certain demographics. And this one is fascinating because there's stats you can find. If you've already released music, um, you, can, you can pull up your Spotify stats or whatever and see who is actually listening to your music. This takes some organic success, I think, for the stats to mean anything. Um, otherwise, it's just the people you've shared it to. If you're getting like, you know, under a thousand plays on Spotify a month, it's just kind of, you know, the people you're pushing it on. Um, but if you're having some organic traction out there, you can see who is naturally finding it and liking it. Um, and that is useful information too, I think. Age, uh, gender, and, and you know, like comparable artists will start populating as well. So you can see what other bands people are listening to that like your music as well. Yeah, totally. And a good example of like thinking about a demographic would be, I hear a lot of people in my scene, for example, in the punk rock world, complain about how punk rock is dead and the kids don't care about that anymore and like nobody from the 16 to 25 year olds or something listens to punk rock anymore at least not the type of punk rock that we used to listen to and all these complaints right. that probably have been around forever um, throughout the generations of, of people listening to punk rock at this point but i still hear that a lot and um i always think like if you want young people to listen to that type of music then why don't you just make music that is interesting to those people. Like, ch change it up a little bit. Make your your music, your punk rock sound different so that those people care. Uh, because you will never be able, and that's where those demographics come in. You, If you want to attract, like, the 20-year-olds, the 16-year-olds, maybe put some time in and do some research and figure out what they actually listen to, typically. If there is a scene, because there is probably some sort of scene like that still, but maybe what they listen to is a little different to compared to what you were, have listened to when you were 16 or 20. And then put some time into researching that and then try to make music that you still enjoy. That is the music that you want to make, but maybe you can give it a twist. Maybe you can make something that will attract the attention of those people that you want to reach if you want to reach those people. So because you will never be able to convince the younger people to listen to exactly the music that you've listened to, that will not happen. So the only chance to bring back the music that you love and have a passion for to this generation is to make it interesting for them. So instead of complaining, I would just say, like, accept that things have changed and um, try to figure out if there is a way to make something that you still enjoy and that's also relevant to those people. And if you don't want to make that, then you can't complain that the young people don't listen to that. So, And that's where oh, demographics okay. really come in. You have to know what the demographic wants that you are trying to reach. So you have yep. to know what, what 20 years year olds care about, what they listen to, how they dress, how they act, what they what their problems are, what they what your lyrics should be about. You have to understand those people if you want to reach them, yep. I think. I, the next one on our, our list here uh, that I quite like is like a label or type of label you'd love to be signed to. There's so many bands that like are like, all right, we want to make a record and try and get signed, but they can't name a single label that represents music like they make. And it's like, well, this this label is successful because they they are really proficient at a niche, <laughs> you know, uh, and that niche might be pretty wide for a big label, but often there's all these little subsidiary offshoot labels inside of that that focus with like a certain type of music, really. Um, and they, you know, they know all the the radio people in that that genre. You know, they they've got their little market covered. So you need to find that. And by doing that, you'll be actually this is again a good exercise. You'll be finding other bands that have successfully gotten signed and are hopefully you know making a living off this. And you'll learn some stuff by comparing yourself to them again, uh, like opposed to comparing yourself to somebody that is not really doing anything. It's it's better to set the bar high. Absolutely. Same is true for playlisters. Um, yep. And they like, say, yeah, totally. And and it's it's also crazy how th there's only a few people who really think about this. If they, as you said, they say they want to get signed, but they don't put a thought into what it actually takes to get signed. Like what what are, what do the other bands on that label typically sound like? How do you know what do they do? Um, and so if you want to be on on that label next to all these other bands, uh, it might be worth investigating a little bit and, and figuring out. What, what like increases your chances of, of being there if that's what matters yeah. to you, right? Totally. And then the best way would be to do something unique. You don't want to copy the others, but still make it so that that it's relevant to that label. That's the the difficult part then. It's like be you, be authentic and create something new, but also do the things that the people in charge probably like. 
Yeah, you know? absolutely. And like so other bands you want to tour with and promoters and bookers, like that that's all like you should be able to name people right right away. And yeah. you know, if you find a band you want to tour with, well, chances are some of those bands are on the same label because that tends to cross pollinate and and then, you know, knowing who they're the promoter or agent is honestly if you can't name the name of one person at that label you're gonna have a hard time getting signed there which is yeah. <laughs> something again i don't think most people listening to this podcast could pull that off It'd be very hard to but it's like okay you really haven't looked into it if you're honest then you, ha- you haven't found point. the name of like you haven't got somebody's email how, how are you like this is just something you're talking about then this is all made up <laughs> absolutely it's like similar that's such a great that's it's so great that you bring that up it's similar to like applying for a job, but you don't know who is running the company and who is in charge of hiring people. And like, you know, if you apply for a job, you you know those things. You better know those things. Totally. And, and just, it's the same thing as a band. You're basically applying um, and and you have to know who you're talking to and what they like and like how to increase your chances of getting the gig, you know? so Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So the next one on the list is really important to me because... I think when when I created this outline, it, it kind of I kind of it kind of got me thinking that this all is also a lesson in or an exercise in empathy in a way because if you want to connect with people, if you want to get your message across, if you want to be heard, if you want to, people to care about your music, you need to understand those people. You need to understand what they are worried about. You need to understand what they are going through in their life, what what they are experiencing. The better you know those things, the better you can make something that matters to them. If if you want to create a certain emotion or if you want to help people through a certain phase in life with your music uh, or if you want to cover a certain topic that's important to you and help people through that, you really got to understand those people because if you don't, if you you will all, only be able to do it on a very superficial level or you will only you will only be able to do it from your own experience which might not be enough. So you have to do more to really understand what people are going through, the, the people you want to reach, how they feel, what they're thinking about, what matters to them, what they worry about. And then you, you have a much better chance of actually connecting with them and ultimately help them with your music. That's really important to me. It's really it's really about empathy in a way, I think. Right. Yeah. And I think sometimes people get lucky on all of these things. Yes. You know, like they're just making it for themselves and they happen to connect with like, you know, an entire generation. Like I think in a Nirvana, you know, it's just like they just... Ha, they they just were what people needed. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. And but but just even though that is maybe true that they weren't trying to pull all that off, they still did it. You know, like like it it was music that did connect with a certain type of person. Like it checked all of these boxes, even though they weren't trying to. So maybe you have to try to do it. Like so what? You know, you can't assume you're going to get as lucky as that. So it's like figuring out how to accomplish all of those is really what we're talking about. Yeah, first of all, never compare yourself to the outliers. Mm-hmm. Never assume you're going to be a unicorn too. Like, that's not going to, that's not realistic. And then second, Nirvana might not have planned their success and all of that, the mainstream success. But they definitely thought about that they don't want to connect with, like, the people who listen to mainstream music at that point. Yeah. They they definitely thought about that they wanted to be different. They had in mind who they were talking to. They had a, a scene or people around them that they were talking to it they happened to reach a lot more than than those people <laughs> but they definitely the way they were and why it actually worked was because actually they had some pro- probably they had something different in mind and that's what happened to work but they still i don't know how to say it was intentional that they were not like the stuff that was on the radio at the time so right. you could argue that they still did it intentionally and they didn't know what's going to come from that but they had sort of an idea of who they were talking to and specifically yeah, who, who right. they were not talking to, Yeah, I think. Yeah, which is just as good, really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. Um, so yeah, people who are part of a scene you want to be in or you're actually a part of, it could be that you are in within a scene, in a certain scene, a certain genre, whatever, And but it turns out that the music you're making actually has a lot of influence, influences from other genres, other scenes, whatever, and it might not really resonate with the people you, you wanted to resonate with. So you could... If you don't think about it, it could be that you play these shows with with these bands and you are in these venues and in the scene, but your music never really doesn't really fit there. And maybe you have to go somewhere else entirely with your music, or you have to think about changing your music so that the people in the scene you're in actually care about it. That could be like it's a self awareness thing almost. And some people are part of a certain group of people or scene, and 
but make something completely different, but are afraid to admit that they actually like different music. So they feel like they have to do that because that's their, you know, circle of mm -hmm. people and like how they were raised and all that or whatever, or how they, the music that they grew up listening to, but actually they want to do something else and they're having a hard time admitting that or like, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. And then sometimes it takes you know, some time until they, they're like, okay, I'm actually cool with the fact that I like this music and now I, I, I better find people who like this. Uh, right. And yeah, I, I hope that makes sense. Like, but I've, I've seen that. I've seen that happen, definitely. And then you so, put something there, Malcolm, that I want you to talk about. Go ahead, please. Well, yeah, I feel like it, it's kind of been touched on in, in all these previous points, but like, you know, like if, if you're unsure, if you can't seem to look out and find who you're looking for, like, then just look in. It's like, how do you dress? Do you dress like wearing leather, spiked leather jackets and stuff like that? People that also wear that, maybe, and I do mean maybe, might be interested in your music. Who who do you listen to? Like, you know, there is a really obvious one. People that listen to that probably might also like your music. We tend to make music that's kind of along the lines of what we like to listen to. Not exclusively, of course, but, you know, there's, there's clues. Because um, some people just really struggle with putting themselves in other people's shoes, even interested in the same things, you know, like there's, it's, there's just common themes among people. But what I, what I think would be great to end this episode on is uh, a chat or like referencing a chat I had with Courtney LaPlante and Mike Stringer of Spirit Box, which is my, like, it was the 11th episode that you, the Your Band Sucks a Business podcast ever did, but it's still my favorite because they're just an amazing band and they built this amazing audience entirely online. And, and if you go check it out, you could just listen to the first like 10 seconds and get what I'm talking about. Because Courtney says, you're not making music for your friends and family. You know, it's bigger than that or something along those lines. She says it much better than that. So go check it out. But it, it's like, it's yeah. so true. Like, like, especially with this modern world of, of bands trying to build music and an audience and, and business online because it's just more you know, sustainable than trying to hit the road touring and stuff like that. And everybody's, you know, got got jobs and stuff like that they they had to think so much bigger than just like their friends and family who are going to support you as a given they're they're kind of a problem if you are focusing on pleasing those people that you've really built a small pond to try and satisfy you have to go a lot broader not actually not broader more specific but bigger yeah there's a lot of people out there so just Dig deep and and like you can't do better than listening to those two talk about how they did it. It's amazing. They're so smart, so clever. I would highly recommend you check it out. Oh yeah, definitely do that. That interview uh, was great for sure, and they really know what they're talking about because th that's one of those bands that really managed to have a, a huge impact when when in in a time where like people were also saying about metal that it's kind of nobody's into guitar music in general anymore, right. let alone metal. There's no chance of a metal band being successful right now. And they they pulled it off to they're still authentic. They still make their music. They still appeal to to the metal fans. Not to all of them, of course, but they managed to make it so that it's it also appealed to a much bigger audience, to a mainstream mm -hmm. audience also. And of course, when you whenever you do that, you lose some of the hardcore fans that you had before or whatever. Some people have a hard time with things changing or becoming more accessible. Um and they did what I what I was saying before, actually. They took a genre that seemed to be irrelevant almost or like not popular anymore and gave it their own twist in a way and made it made it almost yep. like mainstream successful. Well, not almost, it is mainstream mainstream yeah. success in, in parts of, of the world at least. Um, so Yeah, yeah. And it, it's fascinating because this chat with them was back in like June of 2020. And that was like, they were just starting to get momentum. <laughs> it was impressive then, but it yeah. was like... Like we had no idea what a few years later would look like, and it's like holy cow! <laughs> like they're yeah. playing massive, massive shows right now. Um, and so, so like this, where they were in this podcasting comparison seems humble. It's it's amazing, and it's it shows again how valuable this foresight and planning is because it's like they set it all up and they just had to knock the pins down. It's really really cool. Um, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Go check it out. The, the episode's called "Building an Engaged Online Audience and Why You Should Start Now" with Courtney Laplante and Mike Stringer of Spirit Box, episode eleven of the Your Band Sucks a Business podcast. That's a perfect addition to this podcast, actually. Even the title. That's a perfect match. So I'm going to put that in the show notes. Um, if you go to the Self Recording Band 
dot com slash podcast, you'll find the podcast archive and you just click on this episode or you type in selfrecordingband.com slash and then the number of the episode that will direct you, uh, lead you directly to the show notes page. And I'm going to put that there, the link to that episode um, that Malcolm just talked about. And I also, I'm also going to put the link to Collider State there, the Australian band that I was talking yeah. about in the beginning and all the other stuff that we've been talking about. And yeah, I think this is really a great way to end this. Um, when this podcast is over, go over to your band sucks at business and listen to that episode. <laughs> it's fun. Maybe, maybe take a break in between so you can really take it all in, but then listen yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, hope it helped. And uh, see you next week. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. See you next week.